you so much uh, for taking the time to be with us uh, here today. My name is uh, Raed Faraj, and I work for the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity as a senior investigator and diversity educator. OEOD, the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity, works to coordinate the university's compliance with federal and state laws and university policies and procedures regarding discrimination, retaliation, and sexual harassment, and to promote and integrate the principles of equal opportunity, affirmative action, non-discrimination, and excellence through diversity. OEOD provides a neutral venue for students, faculty, and staff, and those who conduct business with the university to explore <coughs> diversity-related topics and address matters related to equal opportunity, sexual harassment, and or discrimination. Today's event is part of OEOD's um, campus conversation series, which aims to provide the campus community with opportunities to engage in dialogues about contemporary topics related to equal opportunity and diversity. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank our co-sponsors for this event and their rep representatives who um, are here with us today, including the <coughs> Cross Cultural Center, who we truly would not be able to do this work without their tremendous partnership and help through the executive director, Kevin Huey. We also, other co-sponsors include uh, Social uh, School Social Ecology, Center for Citizenship Peace Building, Department of Planning, Policy and Design, Center for Global Peace and Conflict Studies, and the UCI Advanced Program. A couple of reminders before we start. Um, the speaker will be talking for about 20 to 25 minutes or so. Then after that, we're going to open the floor for your questions. The only request I have that please make your remarks brief just in order to accommodate everybody so that they can get their opportunity to ask questions as well. The title for our event today is Walls That Divide Out There and In Here. We are very happy to have Scott Bolins from the School of so Social Ecology with us today. Scott Bolins is a UCI professor of urban planning and the Warmington Chair in Peace and International Cooperation. He studies the intersection of cities and nationalistic conflict and has interviewed more than 240 individuals in the cities of Beirut, Jerusalem, Belfast, Johannesburg, Nicosia, Sarajevo and Mostar, Bosnia and Basque Country and Barcelona in Spain. He is the author of a new book, City and Soul in Divided Societies and has previously written Cities, uh, Nationalism and Democratization in 2007, On Narrow Ground in 2000, and Urban Peace Building in Divided Societies. In his talk, Professor Bolins will examine diversity and division from two perspectives. Uh, number one, as a researcher looking at deeply divided urban areas across the world over the past 17 years, and two, as a teacher of race and ethnicity courses to, un to undergraduate UCI students of diversity, family, and ethnic backgrounds. Before we um, invite uh, the professor, I just want to mention that actually we, for those of you who might be interested, we have the recently published book by the professor here on the table. So any of you interested in looking at it and hopefully purchasing it as well, please feel free to do so. Without further ado, please help me welcome Professor Bolins. Thank you very much, Raid, and um, welcome to everybody here. How many students of mine are out there? Raise your hand. Okay, and the rest of you are here for extra credit? Okay, I'm not stupid up here. I know what's going on. Okay. Uh, it's great you're here, and hopefully you'll be um, informed and hopefully entertained. Okay. Walls that divide out there and in here, out there are those cities that Raid mentioned that I've studied. And these cities are very extreme, and these cities are very polarized, and we hear about them daily. And there's hatred, and there's antagonism, there's violence, and there's war in these cities. And this is where I've done most of my research over the last 17 years. That's out there. In here is a multicultural student body of University of California, Irvine. And I've taught for five times now a class called Urban Inequality, which focuses on race and ethnicity. 
in the history of urban, urbanism in the United States. So my, I'm going to draw from both of those experiences today, both out there and in here. And here is my basic argument and connection between the two. The walls that divide out there in Jerusalem and Belfast and other places like that, in Sarajevo, Bosnia, they are, the divisions out there are punctuated by physical and visible demarcations. There's walls, there's borders, there's checkpoints, there's soldiers. And these divisions and walls are anchored in historic grievances and ethnic identity. Threat and survival is the key in many of these cities that I've studied. In here, we don't have soldiers here. We don't have police at UCI for the most part. We don't have walls of division. We don't have physical demarcations. But what I want to suggest is that we still have walls of division at UC Irvine. They're not physical, they're more psychological. And the main wall of division we have here, and this is based on my teaching of, of this class for five times, is on the, lev on, on the surface level, the level of discussion in class, students avoid and are very hesitant to talk about race and ethnicity out in the open. It's too nasty, it's too disruptive. The media portrays stereotypes right and left, and students, you, stu you folks, probably very understandably don't want to get involved in that public dialogue. It seems too nasty, it, te it seems too sensitive, it seems too personal. But at the same time, based on my interactions with you, students over the years, in office hours and outside of class, in, in more informal settings. At the same time, there's public avoidance. There exists among students of UCI a very deep recognition and understanding of race and ethnicity and where we and you and all of us come from and how important it is our background, our ethnic and racial background, our, our local neighborhood background and history, how important it is in influencing our life history and our life chances. So the wall of division here is, is not physical demarcations, but this difference between a, what I would suggest an understandable public avoidance, but an interior space among you, among us, of how, how utterly important racial and ethnic background is to us, to you, in this life. The wall at UCI, I would say, in here, keeps us from talking and discussing openly issues of race and ethnicity in open civil forums and as part of everyday discussions. Okay, so that's my, my basic argument, out there and in here. Now, I want to give you some, a lot of anecdotes now, really, for you to think about. Um, out there, first of all, um, I have focused my research in these cities of great despair and division. And let me just say those cities again so it kind of resonates with you. Uh, Be Beirut, Lebanon. And if you were to total all of the field research I've done in these cities, probably over two years I've been in these places. Okay, I do field uh, research and interviews. Beirut, Lebanon, Jerusalem, Israel, Palestine, Belfast, Northern Ireland, Johannesburg, South Africa, Nicosia, Cyprus, Sarajevo and Mostar, two cities in Bosnia, former Yugoslavia, and the Basque country region and Barcelona in Spain. Okay? All of these cities have been or still are very polarized beyond division. These cities are platforms for larger hate, or have been, and platforms for nationalistic ethnic conflicts that have fractured and hardened the human and physical landscapes of these cities. These are conflict-ridden, hurt-filled, and often emotionally transcendent cities. I say in the book, much like chain-smoking cigarettes, these cities exude a dangerous and addictive excitement. There is nothing that gets me going in this life more than being out in these very alive, very dangerous, very volatile cities. Out in the streets and gathering places of these polarized cities, there's an intense and continuing drama of the human soul. It both overwhelms 
a Westerner and also connects someone like myself to a larger community. Okay, so now some anecdotes about out there. And they all have to do with divisions. Physical, visible, in your face, blatant divisions. Okay, bear with me. Uh, most of the out, a lot of this material I'm talking about today is anecdotes, so you'll have to kind of pay attention to what's being said or, or kind of snippets of observations. Okay? I walk over, in, in 2010, I was in Beirut, Lebanon. I walk over 20 miles in that city, and I become acclimated to the presence of soldiers, sandbag barricades, barbed wire, and tanks amid the emerging Shiite-Sunni tensions of that city. In Mostar, Bosnia, I traverse what a diplomat called the most sinister street in Europe, which is at the front line in the civil war that took place in the city of Mostar for four years. In Jerusalem, I experienced in 2001, an Israeli west side that is well-lighted, armored, helicoptered, tense, and fortified while the Palestinian east side is darker, more organic, freer flowing, seemingly calmer. In Belfast, I experienced the hardened peace wall geography, along with loyalist Protestant alienation, still in place 14 years after a peace agreement in Northern Ireland. In Cyprus, Nicosia, Cyprus, I meet a Turkish Cypriot writer and poet who travels thousands of miles by airplane so she can bypass the 150-foot 150 150-foot buffer zone and no man's land that hermetically divides Turkish from Greek halves of the city of Nicosia. And in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1995, I drive one night through the surreal and nauseating boundaries on apartheid's racial map down a near-empty road lit with the orange glow of industrial standard lighting into the dark and sleepy black township that is a no-go zone for whites. Being exposed to these cities and their remarkable stories of organized hatred and individual perseverance makes one more human and less patient, patient with research done from a safe theoretical distance. Division, whether it's physical or psychological, is an extremely difficult emotion that spawns hatred, grief, denial, depression, and can spawn forgiveness. Here's other sampling of field notes that I took in, in some of these places. And again, bear with me, they are anecdotal or observational in nature. Sarajevo in Bosnia is a scene of a crime, a rape, a devastation. It's an, effort, it's an affront to humanity and rationality. Blown off limbs, punctured heads, humiliation, playgrounds and soccer fields turned into cemeteries because these were some of the few areas that hillside snipers couldn't see. The ice arena from the 1984 Winter Olympics blown to smithereens, shelled and set afire. Building after building shattered and burnt. How pray tell do I describe these, the photographs of this place to my six-year-old son? Should I? Bosnia. As a parent of two young children, I'd like to believe they're not so young now. They're older now, but still, they're still immature, so I can call them young. As a parent of two young children, I'd like to believe that I would rise above the fears and hatred of living through a horrendous war such as Bosnia's and to pass along a brighter future for my children. Yet this feels like a wish, not a genuine reaction. Are we perhaps mistaken to believe that pain and hatred should dissipate through the generations? I must come to terms with my own gut reaction to what I hear and witness in the former Yugoslavia. If these terrible things were done to me and my family simply because of my ethnic identity, I think the most important task in my remaining life would likely be to tell my impressionable and curious son and daughters, son and daughter, exactly what was done to me and by whom. South Africa. Whites in Johannesburg fear the avenging black, producing gates that separate houses from streets and even parts of houses from other parts of the house. 
Gates provide a benign, friendly feeling of safety, but also a dark reinforcement of the other as demon and threat. In the well-off Ridgeline home we rented while in the city, there was a so-called rape gate in between the home's living room and its sleeping quarters. It was there to block a successful intruder's entryway into our bedroom at night. I recall the feeling that I was losing a bit of my humanity each of the 78 nights that I locked that gate. It made me feel more protected at night, but it did not make me feel better. Israel, in the first few minutes of my interview with a professor at Hebrew University, he confronts me. He says, even as a social scientist, you still need to make a decision about whose side you will take. Are you going to take the side of Israeli, Israel or Palestine? Whose side will you be on? Again in Israel, a specialist in terrorist situations and a professor says the conflict in Israel is all about identity. He asserts that intergroup tensions increase when identity boundaries become fuzzy and permeable. Cyprus, Nicosia, Cyprus. When I ask in a Nicosia conference whether the physical and walled division of the city is politically sustainable, one Greek Cypriot professional rises to his feet, wavering in nervousness and with tears in his eyes and says why it cannot be sustainable and that the pain of loss inside him is unsustainable. Afterwards, I'm admonished by a Greek Cypriot woman who asserts, look what you did bringing up this question, whether Nicosia is sustainable as a divided city. You people come in here and just don't know what you're doing asking such questions. I start to withdraw emotionally. Then I come forward to the gentleman and I enter into a mutual hug because it's too important to our basic humanity not to. And finally, one last observation from Nicosia, Cyprus. Neshin Yashin, who was at that time a 40-year-old Turkish Cypriot poetess, the poet I referred to before, she rejects the false choice of having to choose which side of the politically divided city to live on. That's why she did that long airplane flight that I alluded to before. She says, the problem about ethnic conflicts is they, they create a stratum of society that benefits from the conflict. I call these, she said, conflict breeders. Conflict is their income and their identity. They are the real enemies of peace. So these are tortured cities, and these are observations from very tortured cities. I would say that these lessons are not out there. These lessons are not something that just exists in these extreme newsworthy cities and don't have implications for us. I would say what's going on in these cities are central to broader debates today about urbanism, democracy, and cultural di diversity. There's many cities in North America, many cities in Western Europe that are going through fundamental changing demographics, cultural radicalization, and migration that creates a, multi, a fragile multicultural society and a public interest that can be quite fragile and cleavages. So the lessons from these extreme cases are important for us. Someone once said, extreme conditions tell stories larger than themselves. They give us lessons that are broader than just the extreme conditions. The emotional scars and physical and psychological separation one faces in these polarized cities provide us, potentially, mirrors into the fear, separation, exclusivity, and denial that course through many of our urban experiences. The extreme nature of polarized cities only makes more visible those urban characteristics that most cities share. In so-called normal cities, we become insulated and protected from past histories and the basic human impulses that individuals in these extreme polarized cities must deal with daily. So that's out there. What about in here? The following observations are based on, on teaching of undergraduate UC Irvine students five different times in this class that I referred to before called Urban Inequality which focuses on race and ethnic inequality as its, its anchoring subject. The experiences with these students, and I would say I've probably been exposed to now almost 500 students in the five teachings of these, class, these classes. 
It leads me to this observation, which I said before, that inside a surface level avoidance and hesitancy to speak about these things in group settings, there lies very often very thought-provoking and often very deeply contemplative thoughts about the sensitive issues of race and ethnicity. However, these personal observations by students usually do not come out during classroom discussions. The issues are felt to be too personal and sensitive to broach when there are 40 to 80 other students around, such as this setting here. Rather, I hear these insights in personal con uh, conversations during my office hours or when students are asked to write evaluations of what they've seen in my class or the class itself. I ask students very often to evaluate what they see, whether it's a video or the class itself. Tell me how you feel. I've taught on five occasions this upper division undergraduate course. Most students are 19 to 20 years old. I estimate on average about 60% of them would be Asian, what the Bureau of the Census would call Asian American, about 30% Anglo and about 10% Latino or African American. Many students have a very blended racial and ethnic background, what the Census Bureau since 2000 calls multiracial. It's always wonderful when we talk about how the US Census Bureau classifies people ethnically and racially and people look around and think, my god, what am I, according to the US Census. Um, a troubling characteristic of the class normally stands out, and that is this, a strong underrepresentation of African Americans in the class compared to their presence in the Southern California region. This low proportion of African Americans is, African -Americans is especially poignant because so much of the material on urban, racial, and ethnic inequality is rooted in the black-white racial uh, relations experience the black-white disparities, and the African-American urban experience. So much of that is an anchoring force behind urban inequality, and yet African-Americans are usually underrepresented in the class. I'm going to give you now a set of student comments and reflections, not about the class, but to a film that I show. The film is called Skin Deep, 1995. It's an hour-long film about race and cultural diversity. And it brings together a whole diverse set of American college students. And they reflect on each other. They reflect on different races. They reflect on their upbringing. I highly recommend the film. The film now is 17 years old, but it's still highly relevant and still feels very contemporary. The students in the film come from diverse racial, religious, and economic backgrounds. And the film portrays how they grew up and then their experience going into college and what they confronted when they got into a, a multicultural, multiracial setting. The film's tough and I believe a very appropriate look at race and ethnicity issues. So here are the observations. Almost all of these are on the film itself. Okay? An Asian American female says that political correctness reigned very much in the classrooms I spent my childhood in. My friends and I were in tune with the concept. Many of us had two cultures, an American culture and a culture our parents acquired from growing up in a different country. We learned how to be sensitive and respect and to be open to understand these two different cultures. A Latino male, I am now more aware of the ways in which racism exists around me. I see it everywhere, on television, on campus, and at home. An Asian American female, my concern is that negative attitudes about race and ethnicity are generated by authority figures. The issue of categorizing race and ethnicity is made to seem natural. An Anglo female. I've always felt that skin color does not matter, and it was not I or my family that caused the pain of other cultures. So how could people not like me? An African American female. Although I grew up in a racially mixed environment and had many Latino friends, when I came to UCI, I flocked to the, Af to the African American crowd. Hanging out with them just felt like home. An African American female. I was in a class and the professor made a comment stating there were no gangs or violence in his school district because all his students were white. I felt compelled to say something because the school I attended was 95% African American and we did not have those problems either. 
but I hesitated to comment because I did not want to stand out. Looking back on it, I feel ashamed I did not speak up. A Latino male. I personally know of all the setbacks that a minority faces that can be hurtful to one's self-esteem. An Anglo male. The amount of racism portrayed in the video was kind of startling to me. I found myself looking for excuses for the movie to be false, like maybe the movie was old and times have changed. But honestly, I guess they haven't. Asian American female. What bothered me the most was that the video was made in the mid-1990s. When I was watching the raw emotions and hard racism, I thought it might have been made earlier. A multiracial female. I identified with the interracial mixed group of students. Their struggles were my struggles, and I agreed with them that having to choose one or the other racial category is a disheartening experience. I love talking about race, and my best friend and I have gotten into some pretty good disagreements. Just a few more. An Anglo male. It has always been an ongoing dilemma for me how to, to properly deal with the fact and the practical nature that no one is exactly the same considering all the attributes. How do we in the present choose to deal with the mistakes we've made in the past? Or is it inevitable that racism will continue to exist forever? A female, unclassified. Being forceful and adamant is necessary in discussions about race. Passivity allows old habits and beliefs to perpetuate. Asian American female. Since racial issues are very sensitive topics, it's hard to discuss, not only with family, but friends as well. The thing I do not understand is if racial issues are, are so sensitive, why are there so many racial jokes? A female. I'm both Korean and white. Ever since I was little, I considered myself both. It does not make any sense to me to deny any part of me, because that is the same as denying who I am as a whole. A Latino male, I think intolerance and prejudice is mostly learned through the normal process of growing up and socializing. Oftentimes it becomes inevitable that those thoughts and attitudes will arise. The struggle is to consciously overcome these feelings through understanding and self-control. Then two more, Anglo female, I don't think I look at the people I meet in terms of the color of their skin or their ethnic background. However, however, I do think that I look at race as a whole in a stereotypical way. African Americans live in poor neighborhoods. Asian Americans are quiet and hardworking. Unidentified student. I didn't realize how passionate I felt about race, ethnicity, and culture until I saw this video. So again, in class and in public settings, I would say most students tend to be quiet and guarded about sensitive diversity issues. And I, there's no blame here. I think this is quite understandable. You look at how race is portrayed in the media, people shouting at each other in media about race and ethnicity issues, the categorization of race and ethnicity in media and all around us. It seems a very rational response, especially in public, not to talk freely about it. So it's not a blame here at all. It's an understandable process. What I want to emphasize is what's inside, and what I found inside of students, you folks out there and other students at UCI, is a very rich appreciation of race and, and ethnicity, and a very deep understanding that it's very important in this society. Then one last thing I want to end with, and this is a challenge. This is the challenge that we face at UC Irvine. In many of the areas where UC Irvine draws students and applicants, many urban areas of California, there is, there are strong, there is strong racial, ethnic, and income segregation. We go through this in class, segregation, racial segregation, residential segregation between white, Latino, and black, still very strong in many, many cities across the United States including cities in California where most of UCI students come from. Also strong racial segregation in the kindergarten through 12 
education experience, school <coughs> system still strongly segregated because school, where you go to school is tied to where you live. If residential areas are segregated, school systems will be. So I have this in mind when I look out at the diversity of the student backgrounds in the classes I teach, and it is an amazingly diverse background of students and a very blended multicultural mix that's amazing. You probably only see it here in Southern California and maybe in the New York area. When I look out at the diversity of student backgrounds, I know these are, these are, there's a lot of success stories of kids who have raised themselves from disadvantaged areas of Latino and African American concentrated neighborhoods. I know that. Uh, just the fact that we have segregation and concentrated areas of minority and poverty in California does not prevent non-white students from attaining uh, membership in this UCI university. But it certainly makes it hard. And segregated, disadvantaged areas stack the odds against many uh, non-white minorities and make it very hard for them to get here. So I look out at my classes and I know those are, this, those are many success stories there of overcoming hardship and overcoming disadvantage. But I also know that for every success story that's filling up a seat, sitting in a seat in Social Science Lab 248, every success story there, that there's probably 100 kids that are not sitting in that, in that room. And there's 100 kids of, of, of like ethnic or racial background that are non-white minorities who are not in my classroom because they are severely hampered by the unequal structures of opportunity that face them in their daily lives growing up in disadvantaged neighborhoods, poor, uh, less poor served uh, school systems that, are, that do not facilitate their ability to get to the college level. The walls, I would say, that divide our society, whether it's California or the United States, they're not physical ones and they're not manned by soldiers. But I would say, suggest to you that they're nonetheless real and can be just as debilitating in their impacts. Thank you. And I think I'm going to take questions or have a discussion about this. Now I just told you you folks don't easily talk about race and ethnicity, so let's talk about race and ethnicity. <laughs> But you can ask me any questions or make comments either about the UCI part, the in here part, or maybe the safer out there part, some of the research I've done in uh, polarized cities. But I know it's a lot of material thrown at you, a lot of anecdotes. Um, any questions you have or thoughts? Yeah. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned a couple times in your speech that bringing up these sensitive issues public spaces uh, might be areas of like where you know aggression comes up or like I mean you mentioned the sensitive issues but uh, and people generally shirk away from engaging in, in public uh, conversation about this but what it, it seems like you alluded to the you alluded that maybe they might be beneficial. So I wanted to get your opinion how so yeah. yeah. Yes, they are very beneficial. So when I said that the public discussions don't take place a lot because we all tend to avoid and be hesitant about bringing up these sensitive issues. The follow-up to that, and, and notice the setting there was a classroom of about 100 students. Difficult to ask the question you know, of a sensitive racial, ethnic nature. But what we need are other types of forums, meetings that are civil in nature, not so much structured classroom-based, especially with 100 students. Maybe smaller classes too might work, but civil forums where people can bring up those, you know, what what might feel to them those embarrassing, incredibly personal questions about their own background, uh, about some experience they had growing up, uh, and what it all meant. They've been wondering about this ever since it happened to me back in sixth grade, something like that, you know. Um, so the physical setting has to be right. The forums have to be right. They have to be set in a way that is mutually reinforcing, uh, nurturing, uh, where all responses are given equal respect. So 
you know, for a university to create civil forums, you know, that's part of what it does. You know, this could be seen as one or, or a set of uh, a series of workshops or something that would engage students, diverse students with each other would be another type. So yes, we need those public discussions. I say we need those discussions because it takes the power out of race and ethnicity when we can talk about it more openly. If we, if we avoid it and are hesitant to bring it up publicly, I think it gains power. And it gains power because there's lots of people that talk about race and ethnicity in this society, right? Turn on Fox News. They'll tell you all about race and ethnicity in this society and, and use all sorts of coded messages, stereo, stereotypes, coded messages. So it's not, like if, it, you know, it's not like if we're quiet about it, no one else will talk about it in society. There's all sorts of people that are using race and ethnicity as coded messages out there for electoral or political reasons. So the university has this opportunity to create, and it, and it does a pretty good job with this, I would say. It should probably do more of creating these civil forums where these more open discussions can happen about sensitive issues. Yes? When you were out there, how did they speak about race and ethnicity? Yeah, good question. Out there, how do they speak about race and ethnicity? Uh, fundamental, uh, a split point in South Africa, of course, was, was race. Black, white, and a third category by the state, coded by the state as colored, mixed. So here was, the, here was the central government of South Africa just totally classifying individuals by race and, and, and you know, splitting apart society residentially and so forth based on, on racial composition. The other place is ethnic is more ethnic identity, more ethnic identity. Um, so one, and, and sometimes linked with religion, right? So ethnic identity, what I mean by in former Yugoslavia and Bosnia, the conflict between, was between Serbs, Croats, and Muslims. Or, yeah, so which is three different main ethnic and religious uh, identities. Back to your question, how do people there talk about uh, ethnic identity? It's absolutely a fundamental source of identity for them. These are societies where there's, there's threat, where each group feels threatened, trying to survive, trying to cope in the face of potential and real conflict. So bringing within yourself, you know, using your ethnic identity is a way of creating a, a group solidarity. So they're very much aware of their ethnic identity. They can trace it back 400 years, not only in their family, but you know, a famous war or battle that took place 400 years ago where the Serbs lost. You know? So they have that reference point, that historic grievance, and ethnic identity is, is a critical form, the critical form of identity in these countries. Uh, it's what leads to the conflict and leads to the war, but even in situations like, for instance, Lebanon. Lebanon went through a 16-year civil war from 1975 to 1991. Here we are 22 years later, still, you know, back in the, in, in the civil war, it was Christian versus Muslim, if we can use uh, broad categories. Now Lebanon is fracturing between Christian on the one hand and also Shiite versus Sunni Muslim on the other, reflecting national, international dynamics. So 22 years after a war that decimated that country, still ethnic and religious identity is the key form of identity in that country. And a good follow, you know, the, the open question or the good follow-up is, what do we do about that? You know, that, and that's a long, long answer. But what do we do about that? How can we have those groups adhere to their group identity, but at the same time have allegiance to something greater than that single group? How do we create a multicultural society that works and holds together? Major challenge. Yes? Shift it more by 
moving kids between the schools, busing them, etc. And yeah. there's dialogue out there whether they're against it and how. And yeah. um, what is your opinion? Is that a good starting point at least? Um, is there anything else that can be done to try to diversify the school system? Yeah. Good question. I mean, the biggest problem with the school system, K through 12, is, is it's tied to residential location for the most part. Where you live, your neighbor, you go to your neighborhood school. So if you live in a segregated uh, neighborhood, 95% African American neighborhood in South LA, you're going to go to a 95% or more uh, black student body. So residential segregation gets translated into school segregation. There are different ways, as you know, I can tell by your question, there's different ways of breaking that linkage. They're hard. In the olden days, we relied a lot on busing. Still, still to a minimal extent we do. But busing kids from poor, disadvantaged minority neighborhoods into basically white schools so they could get the experience of being with whites, being with a better resource school. There's other ways of breaking that today. We use magnet schools. We use charter schools. Magnet schools are a way of having a larger catchment area. So magnet schools draw from a much larger area, all sorts of different neighborhoods, rather than just the, the neighborhood close by. So those are, those are all needed. I would say much more is needed because you look at, you look at racial segregation indices of cities and ethnic segregation indices of cities in Southern California. And the segregation indices are quite, still quite high. And that's still going to get translated into, into, for the most part, separate schools. And then the question becomes, not only are those separate schools, but the, the schools with strong Latino populations tend also to be under-resourced in terms of teacher quality and, and so forth. Um, so not only are the school systems separated racially and ethnically, but there's a disparity in the quality of those schools. So anything and everything is needed. Busing is a very extreme approach to it and really raises the hackles of a lot of, of uh, white population out there. So that's, that's one that has to be used in moderation as it is today. But magnet and charter schools, to the extent that they're truly inclusive of diverse student body and diverse socioeconomic backgrounds, those are moves in the right direction. The other longer term is to, and this is much longer term, uh, change and shift the, that, res, that residential structure. So through land use zoning policies, creating more integrated racially ethnically and income, more integrated residential environments, then that gets translated into a more diverse school experience. But that's a longer term project because you're dealing with residential location at that point. Yes? Do you have any, have you done any research on success stories where the, the divide has been bridged, where communities have formed yeah. that heal work yes, you're in a very diverse community? I mean, is there hope, I guess? Yeah, you're looking for optimism. <laughs> the success story, there's there's two success stories, but they're different from each other. One is Barcelona, Spain. Now you think, where's the conflict in Barcelona, Spain? Isn't that like a place with great architectural places and you sit outside in patios and have fun? Yeah, that's true. That's Barcelona. But it's in the old days, uh, it was, Spain was controlled by a dictator, Franco. And Franco decimated Barcelona and the region that Barcelona is in, Catalonia. So, that was the nationalistic conflict, and we came out of that in 1975, so it's been a long time. Since 1975, Barcelona and Catalonia, the region, have been created as a pretty successful multicultural, multilinguistic region and city. And you think, who are the two groups? The two groups are the native Catalan people born in, in Catalonia, who really Many of them do not feel they're Spanish. They're, they're Spanish. They're Catalan instead, kind of a mix of French and Spanish. They would disagree with that portrayal. They're Catalans um, on the one hand, but also Spaniards on the other. Many immigrants from elsewhere in Spain came into Catalonia. So the two groups that exist there, 
multilingual in that one speaks Catalan, one speaks Castellano Spanish, um, coexist pretty well. And there's a robust regional nationalism in Catalonia that is existing pretty well within, a more, with, with, within the central Spanish state. So that would be potentially a success story. And there's reasons why that is. The other success story is more a success of the process, and that's South Africa. And the success story there is that country changed from a racial, racist regime of apartheid to a, to a, a, a true democracy. They did it over a long period of time. It was a negotiated process, but it happened, and it worked. And the old white regime did give over its power to what now is, is, will be for a long time a, more a black regime, since black South Africans are in such a strong majority. And we must not overlook that. There's lots of troubles in South Africa today, crime and it's chaos. But we shouldn't overlook the fact that we went from a white racist, basically a dictator regime, authoritarian regime, into a, into a a majoritarian democratic regime in South Africa. And that was, that was, that's amazing that that happened, that process happened. And if you want hope, you know, Barcelona gives us more hope about substance, that we have two groups living together pretty productively. South Africa gives one hope about the process, that we actually can move through that process from a horrendous regime into something that has, uh, more, you know, more respectful of democratic rights. Yes, in the back first. Um, yeah, I just had a comment about my practices. Um, I come from, my dad's family, and my mom's from the Philippines. And so before, like, coming to university, I always thought of, like, my family as sort of a success in terms of cultural and racial integration. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, because it's a very, like, happy, it's a kind of family, I'd say. Um, but then I took a Chicano studies class they were talking about La Raza Cosmica, um, the cosmic race, and how Mexico essentially is this mixture of races. And I, well, I was telling my parents I was so happy to discuss with them, like, this is what we are, like, we're a mix of race. And they were surprising me, got so upset. They thought that I was, like, saying that I related more to the Mexican culture than, like, their culture at home. Uh -huh. And, like, that was so shocking to me because I thought they'd be so open to it. But instead, they were just disappointed. And wow. It was just, interesting. Yeah, just really interesting experience. They saw you going outside of your culture rather than relating to the, the idea of mix. Yeah, and, and, and they're like, why don't Wow, good question. The psychological walls certainly exist in South Africa. So when I say it's a success of process, psychological walls between the white minority population and the black majority is, is substantial. Those, that psychological break is still quite severe, uh, generalizing. Um, psychological walls in uh, Barcelona, Spain, I think there's been genuine, there's been a degree of genuine mixing, I think, of the two populations. But they also, there's, at the same time, there is a delineation between the two populations. Um, there's, there's some characteristics unique to the political process there that where Catalans were given more authority than before, 
and instead of creating what, what many refer to as like an exclusive nationalism, it's us and everyone else is outside, created more an inclusive nationalism, inclusive, that included everyone within the physical space of Catalonia, no matter whether you're Catalan, ethnically Catalan, or whether you're a Spanish immigrant. And I think that notion of nationalism as inclusive, still containing, you know, it still contains Catalan regional identity, so it doesn't water it down, but it's inclusive versus an exclusive nationalism. When we get into an exclusive nationalism, we're in a real heap of a mess. Um, uh, because then it's us versus them, right? Syria right now, you know, everyone right now is talking about Syria in terms of at what extent, to what, at what time is that going to turn into a sectarian conflict? A conflict between sectarian groups identified by religion and ethnicity. It may have already, but there's ethnic components to that. You have a mind, very uh, much of a mind, uh, Assad, the leader, is very much part of a minority uh, sect, a minority part um, of, of the Shiite religion. Is that right? And uh, you know, to what extent that might turn into a, a, a Sunni Shiite conflict, and then get linked to everything else going on in the Middle Middle East. You know, there there would be exclusive nationalism in practice, and at that point, things become very, very inflammatory. It's us versus them. I took your, your question all a huge direction there, but hopefully that was informative, partly informative to your question, yeah. The, uh, another success story of, of I know the speaker, that I, I knew the questioner here, another success story might be Brazil, of a truly mixed, multi-racial, multi-ethnic society with so much blending. That could potentially be held up as another success story, if you will. Okay. Is that it? Thanks for coming, folks.